and um, an interesting morning, and, and um, thanks everyone for um, your involvement in that, and it's obviously a pretty, pretty special moment, a big day for regional council. Um, so if we can just carry on, um, our chair, Ormsby, is just tied up with um, some media um, engagement, so hopefully she'll be able to join us back soon. Uh, we just have to go back to a little bit of housekeeping. Any conflict of interest de declarations today? There are none. Great. And now we'll move on to confirmation of the minutes on the 10th of July. If, um, Councillor Williams happy to move that they're correct and Councillor Van Bake to second. Thank you. And on to our next item on the agenda, uh, the Hawke's Bay Regional Land Transport Plan 2024 to 2034. I'll ask um, Katrina to come up and just introduce that. Uh, essentially, this is an adoption of the Regional Land Transport Plan 2024-2034. Uh, it's a recommendation that comes to you from the Regional Transport Committee after having held public consultation following submissions, public hearings and deliberations. Uh, as you well know by now, the Regional Transport Committee uh, is required to prepare every three years a regional land transport plan. That regional land transport plan sets out the program of activities for uh, our regional council in terms of public transport, road safety, uh, total mobility, but also for the TLAs in terms of their, uh, their uh, roading program for the next three years. Uh, the program of work set out in there, I'm probably using the wrong term, Bryce, correct me, but essentially all the work that the region intends to do uh, forms the bid that goes essentially to uh, central government, Waka Katahi's board, uh, where they make all of the funding decisions under the National Land Transport Fund in accordance with the National Land Transport Program. Um, happy to take questions. Um, we could go to questions or, or we could ask Sorry. Um, Councillor Williams and Van Baek if you'd like to, yeah, if, if you'd like to speak, you're welcome to now. Sure. Um, I, before I do that, I'm wondering if Katrina, you'd like to take the opportunity to introduce us to a new member of staff. I would. Uh, Russell, can you you just join us up here, I think. Um, I, I am incredibly delighted uh, to introduce you all to Russell Turnbull. Uh, he comes to us from uh, uh, GoBus yes. and uh, is our new transport manager. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Welcome. Nice to be here. Welcome. Thanks so much for taking that on. Uh, Chair, I'm wondering if I could just speak briefly to the report and the process that's in front of you, and I hope to come back to Russell as part of that. Um, it, 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 you know, <laughs> We've had a lot on this year. Uh, we've had a revenue and finance policy. We've had a long-term plan. But we've also had a regional land transport plan. And in fact, that process has gone on for 18 months um, from its first genesis. And, and it started with uh, a challenge I levelled in December 22 that we be pretty radical and bold in, in setting up this region to be more resilient um, to the effects of climate change in our transport system, but equally deliver through step changes in public transport and active transport in particular, um, you know, real gains or wins in terms of driving emissions down. Um, so to really think in some in new ways. And then, of course, we know what happened. Um, and this was supposed to be a light touch review of the um, transport plan, but as the paper explains, it ended up being a wholesale rewrite as our transport network uh, needed wholesale um, resurrection, in a way, as a result of that, uh, that event. And I think, if anything, um, what you're reading in this regional land transport plan, and I'm sure you've all read it cover to cover, um, is a lesson in that if we don't manage uh, land erosion and woody debris properly, or the way we vegetate and, and use our land in the, in the catchments, in the hill country in particular, 
we lose a spectacular amount of, of transport infrastructure, including all the bridges that, that uh, now need to be replaced, and um, that you know we don't integrate our transport system, including our bridges and our roading and our rail infrastructure, with our you know understanding around flood resilience at our peril. Um, so. There's some huge learnings about that. We've heard some of it from the independent panel today uh, about you know, integrating uh, the rebuilding of our transport network to align with the way we rebuild uh, the region generally. We've got a billion dollar task ahead in terms of just fixing our rural roads. Um, and you know, th this is orders of magnitude beyond the budgets of our territorial authorities' capacity to achieve. Um, so we've tried to navigate all of that and we have um, I'd probably take you to, uh, in addition to the incredibly interesting context, um, the objectives and policies here put a real priority around resilience. That is, um, that all investments made uh, with the funding that we might be able to attract through this plan, um, through the National Land Transport Fund, uh, for example, <coughs> to ensure that all new replacement assets strategically integrate with natural hazard management systems, and, and they build in redundancy so that if one transport part of the network fails, another one's there. And that's exactly what we didn't have. Uh, and that was one of the big big learnings. But on the flip side of that, and, and I keep coming back to this um, as a personal perspective, that you can't, this is a, so there's a huge focus on adaptation to climate change in here. And necessarily so. But as I shared before, and it's actually James Shaw who coined this term, Di, I think you've, you've heard me use it before, um, if we don't actually tackle the emissions that this region generates and indeed the world generates in which we are part of, it, it's just like putting bigger and bigger buckets on the floor while the, the real problem is that the roof is leaking. Um, and I see public transport and active transport as an opportunity um, to really bring down the region's emissions profile. It is 20% of the regional emissions. <coughs> and we have uh, an, an objective to drive down uh, drive a, a you know, literally a low emissions transport system, including through a range of AT and pub, active transport and public transport networks, including specific public transport and active transport corridors um, that are you know, targeted to the purpose. Um, whether that's the way to go or not, there's other you know, there's other views about that. But um, what's happened, unfortunately, and this is a question I know uh, is interesting, at least one of the councillors around this table, is that in the midst of preparing this plan, we had a change of government, we had a change of focus of the government policy statement, um, which, whereas it was previously had a strategic priority on climate change mitigation, no longer does. Um, and the level of funding for public yeah, transport was substantially ratcheted back under the current government policy statement, and it's left us in a position we were really just treading water, and the step change we wanted to deliver in public transport is now going to be very challenging to deliver, and that's where I come back to you, Russell, because that's why we're so delighted that if anyone can do it, you can. The work within, uh, the, new, work within the new model we've got, which is about frequency over coverage, uh, in a way that with our available funding at its reduced level, means we do get the maximum returns in terms of uh, fare box recovery, people on the buses, and driving emissions down with the budget we've got. Um, the last thing I really wanted to say about this is, is, is it is, as it was explained, a bid for funding from the National Land Transport Fund, which is massively oversubscribed. I mean, we had Simeon Brown on the radio this morning talking about building four lanes to Whanganui. Mm. Where do you think we fit into that? Right? We're going to get... Probably from a $4.7 billion bid to do everything we need to do to make this region resilient, to actually withstand uh, the likes of another Cyclone Gabriel, we're probably going to get three or $400 million, right? That's what we got last time. Uh, so think about, that's just an order of magnitude difference. You know, it's a tenth of, of what we need. Um, and... The, the priority, because the government priority statement is on roads of national significance, will be if there is a shortfall of funding, and there is, it's the expressway that's going to win. Mm. Right? So that will mean that the Waikati Gorge replacement to Wairoa, um, if there is a, a known shortfall of funding, 
won't go ahead. It's our number one priority in our plan. It's our number one project. It's been there for years uh, on the books. We'll get a tolled 6.5k expressway that's got no capacity to build in other modes for active transport or public transport at the expense of any improvements in our public transport system, which could take congestion off that expressway, uh, the Waikari Gorge uh, uh, deviation, or any enhancements or improvements to State Highways 2 and 5, uh, which are critical lifelines connecting our economy to the engine room uh, of the North Island. So those are the challenges that we face, but we decided we would uh, put our own vision and tell our own story, and the Transport Agency told us to do that within this plan. And governments will come and governments will go. We do think there is a very good degree of alignment with the, with the government policy statement as it stands around resilience and investing in uh, you know, optimum returns, maintenance and that sort of thing. Um, but we have not let go of our desire to reduce emissions in the region and to have an integrated transport system that works as exactly that. A system. So thank you, Chair, for letting me ramble on for so long about all of that. That's the plan. It's a big journey with the community. We had a lot of submissions. We've addressed them in the ways that are set out in that report. And no, I don't have any questions, but that may have triggered some questions from the staff um, from what I've shared. Yeah, we will go to a motion and chance to speak, but um, if, if Councillor Van Bank yeah. wants to help introduce the paper anymore, and then we can go to questions. Yeah, just a comment, quick comment. Uh, and, and with tongue in cheek this morning, I took upon myself to actually look at page 86 of the report, and it just <laughs> happens to be uh, um, that the head is uh, uh, asset maintenance backlog, and really that's where we sit. And uh, Martin has already um, explained it very <coughs> clearly and, and, and very accurate of what we, at the big projects where we'll be sitting with, with that constraint on funding, but we also have the issue with rural roading. And it's, it's a very important issue for us right around the Rohi and that we shouldn't forget. So some of the really good things that we should be doing and, and from an act of transport, which I believe is health and well-being, um, we should actually move there. We're not this plan won't legislate the RTAs to make those changes, unfortunately. They can take it at their peril. They don't have to. And because they're under that backlog of maintenance <coughs> in those areas of, of rural roading and, and other roading, unfortunately, we, we've lost through the cyclone. We lost maybe 10 years of some really good thinking that actually was in place. So that's the unfortunate part. So it's not all good news, unfortunately. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Fenbeck. If we could just go to questions now, um, Councillor Harding. Kia ora, Chair. Um, <clears throat> look, this may be a question for staff or it may be even a question for the Chair of the Committee, Councillor Williams. Um, <clears throat> what I'm trying to do is <clears throat> understand the current level of ambition in, in this land transfer plan in relation to carbon reduction and how that relates to national ambition. And it was a little, it's a bit hard <coughs> to pick through the report, but on page 55 of the report, it mentions the decarbonising transport action plan, uh, which sets our targets of 41% reduction yep. by 2035 and net zero by 2050. And I'm just, and I'm looking at this from the frame of, this is a 30-year plan. We're already at 2024, so how does our regional ambition? aligned to where we need to be and how does it relate or, or not relate to national ambition. And as best as I could tell, the ambition in here was 20 or 30 per cent, I think, over 30 years. So I'm just looking for to understand that and to understand how, if our ambition was different, what we might choose to do differently. And, and I'll just throw up the example of one of the one of the initiatives in there is $4 million for a roundabout. It's not even a highway, a state highway roundabout. Just think how many e-bikes that you could, you, you could buy and put on the road for $4 million. Uh, and instead of having, you know, trials in Auckland, I think it was, where, you know, a dozen e-bikes uh, are put into a, a giant cage to make sure that nobody could use them um, and that no one would steal them. If we had 1,000 e-bikes on the streets of Napier and Hastings, what, what would that look like? And it would look like, you know, financially one roundabout, but uh, in terms of transforming people's lives in our, in our, um, in our total mobility, um, quite a lot different. Thank you. That's my question. <laughs> ambition well, and what if we what if we're more ambitious? You might want to. Well, I'm happy to have a go. At I that. can. 
I can talk about funding yeah. and ambition versus funding, uh, but you might want to... Well, I'll start to see what you want to sweep up on sure. this, but um, we don't have a quantified metric to meet the 41% um, reduction in emissions or the 20% reduction in vehicle kilometres travelled of the government's emissions reduction plan. Bear in mind, that plan is now likely to be superseded by the next one that the government's currently working on, um, which I don't think will have those targets on it. Mm -hmm. um, so... What we have done, though, is we've leaned very heavily on the new public transport plan and our active transport aspirations to deliver uh, such reduction as we can achieve towards those targets. And we've had to put, and this may be Katrina's point, uh, within the policies that are addressing this, the words subject to funding in front of all of them. Um, because without that funding and without that government policy statement support, which is no longer there, um, we're simply not going to be able to deliver what the emissions reduction plan says. But the problem there is that the government policy statement and the emissions reduction plan of the two different governments are out of sync. And so we fall through a funding <coughs> still in the middle of all that. Yeah. Trina? Uh, yeah, ultimately. Um, I would say that when I first joined this organisation, our previous regional land transport plan set uh, a really ambitious target and we were working uh, really well with Waka Katahi. Uh, and the Ministry in terms of vehicle kilometres re uh, reduction. Um, you'll see uh, in the rank and the projects that are listed in the RLTP, there's a future form and function review uh, and a programme business case. The intent of that under the previous government um, was to identify where we might be able to prioritise public transport and walking and cycling, and certainly that was where the previous government was going and, 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 and making uh, some significant targets to reduce vehicles kilometres travelled. As Martin's indicated, that is not the direction of the current government. Um, they have significantly reduced funding uh, for public transport. Uh, there is absolutely, uh, a, 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 I would say, a slashing uh, to uh, walking and cycling. They have not committed to funding walking and cycling in this current uh, National Land Transport uh, Plan and Fund. And so our, our ambitions, of course, as I said at the beginning, are limited to funding uh, because the community itself is not going to be able to deliver our regional public transport plan that we had put a lot of our emphasis on in terms of ambition. And so we are going to have to take a longer term ambition to that. Mm. There is a looming challenge to all of that in terms of public transport. We are still subject at this point in time to carbon reduction of the fleet for public transport by 2027. We currently cannot afford that in this region. And that's, and I should make, be clear, that is on all new fleet. So what, uh, if, we, if we continue to have the funding struggles that we have, that will result in this region having to let go of our ambitions in terms of carbon reduction, particularly of the public transport fleet, and be accepting of an older public transport fleet that others from around the country will be selling. Thank you. Um, just one last thing I would say on that is that if we were looking at the world through a climate change lens, the very last thing that we would build in Hawke's Bay is a four-lane expressway. That would be the lowest priority of the lot. Um, what you could do with public transport for $800 million would be incredible. <laughs> Um, you could leave two, the two lanes free for commerce, traffic and freight. You could rebuild our rural roads. You could fix the Waikari Gorge. Um, you could have cycle lanes and, and, and what have you for Africa. So, yeah, anyway. Chair, if I could briefly respond. Um, Councillor Williams, you did, um, towards the beginning of your introduction, to, or partway through your, your introduction of, of the land transport plan, point out that it was aspirational so that, and that, yeah. that you were able to paint your own picture and then see what falls out of the sky from Wellington. Um, so I don't buy the excuse that we couldn't be more aspirational in there around climate. Uh, but I, I fully accept that 
the, the practical constraints we face uh, are extreme in terms, in terms of funding. I do challenge, I just ongoing challenge, and I'll keep on challenging you and also giving you the opportunity to, um, to voice the reality that we are simply in the way that we are managing our transport uh, and the decisions that are coming from Wellington are simply failing us at every turn to make the most rational decisions. And I hope that um, you'll forgive me for continually pestering you about this um, the contradictions in that plan. Sure, thank you. Thank you, Chair. We've probably rambled long enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, let's keep it to questions now. Um, Councillor Curtin. Oh, damn. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll keep it to a question, but I, 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 just following on from a comment because I can't help myself. Um, it, it, to me, that it looks like two parallel universes going on here, and I'm just looking at. And apologies to Councillor Williams for for not getting into this as I should have. Um, the, the the regional objectives and policies, five of them. I just can't see how we can get anywhere near them, given the government settings. It's just you know we're, we're just we're going. With cars passing in opposite directions. Excuse that. <laughs> uh, uh, but so, my question um, is uh, what's our ability to influence or what say have we got? And I'm, I'm referring to our objective one, resilience and security, P1.2 point, uh, last dot point, uh, uh, st sorry, strategically integrate with natural hazard management systems in the region. So, I'm picking up on that and saying, what's our ability to ensure that people building bridges or who've got bridges uh, are lifting them up above uh, the hazard zone? Is there any ability to, to really stamp our feet, particularly if we're going to build a four-lane yeah. highway? Through you, Chair, absolutely. Uh, Chris Dolly's asset team are closely connected in with both Trek and Waka Katahi in terms of all of the rebuild projects uh, to determine appropriate heights of any rebuilt uh, bridge or structure. Uh, and so that work's ongoing. Uh, supplementary, Mr Chair. Uh, do, do they require a consent? Uh, they require multiple consents, so uh, both land use and uh, consents from Hawke's Bay Regional Council for uh, most likely, um, and, and I'm talking generally here, most likely for disturbance to a riverbed or something like that. Are they, uh, they, are, they are consented under um, a special consent process uh, through an order in council, which is fast-tracked. Sure. They are controlled activities and we only get to influence conditions. Uh, are they ongoing consents? And why I'm asking is that can we insist that exist? I know the new bridges will be uh, at one, uh, that's an opportunity, but can we say uh, you must raise this bridge? Uh, no. Further question, can we tell uh, Transrail to lift the height of their bridge? I don't believe that's possible. Okay. But, and, but, and I say but, we are working with them closely to try and influence their decision making. And we can have, have met with the Chief Executive of Kiwi Rail yep. to impress on Kiwi Rail that we don't want to see the temporary rail bridge become yeah. a permanent rail yeah. bridge. And we've shared uh, all of our uh, most current uh, scheme, the technical information with all of those bodies, including the infrastructure pile of the RRA, which is a key um, uh, opportunity to share information across the different infrastructure owners. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, question, Councillor Lambert. Yeah, just briefly, I'm very disappointed to hear that the Waikati Bridge is, might be put on the back burner, uh, considering the report we heard this morning where the bridge height should probably be above the floodplain height. And um, realistically, the replacement bridge that's there right now, the Bailey Bridge, is less than half the height of the previous bridge. So is that, hopefully that might make a change somehow. And the new policies come out just like our recommendations out of the report this morning. 
Uh, sorry, is that a question, Councillor Lambert? No, no, Did we put that into the request that it's half the current bridge, it's, it's less than half the height of the previous bridge? Um, through you, Chair, we didn't go to that level of specific detail. However, we did talk about the Waikiri Gorge project as proposed um, in some level of detail within the plan. Um, I do know that there is, through the RRA and the TAs and um, the regional mayors, there's been a range of engagement um, with central government, specifically around Waikere, over the last month or so. so. Thank you. If there's no further questions, we might move to the recommendations. Anyone like to? I move. Councillor Williams moved. Councillor Van Beek second. Anything more to, to speak to? I just to thank the staff for all the hard work, particularly Bryce. It's been uh, must have been an extraordinary effort. It integrates so well with the regional recovery agency and uh, the staff and the other PAs and all the work you and your team have done. Thanks to Katrina and Bryce. And Jeff. Thank you. Board Russell. Yes. Do we vote on it? Yeah. Oh, hang on. No, we voted. <laughs> Councillor Curtin. Oh, I voted. You were putting your, putting your hand up to speak? No, no, no. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, look, I'll, I'll just say um, one thing Councillor Williams said right at the start was about how there's so much going on, and there, and there really is. So for you and Councillor Van Bake um, to take this on as well, it's massive, and the staff. So so thank you to everyone. Um, all those in favour? Aye. Aye. Against? Again, yeah, I want to... Yes, record me as against, thank you. Oh, um, Councillor Harding against. Great, thank you. Thank, thanks, Dan. Um, next item on the agenda H Brick Statement of Intent. So we'll welcome Tom Skirman up. Thanks, Tom. Um, yeah, fill us in and. and um, See if anyone's got any queries, but hopefully this is pretty straightforward. Yeah, uh, thank you, Councillor, uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Councillors. Um, yeah, look, uh, this is a paper split into two parts. There's a process part which is, explains why we're in front of you and why we, there was an extension sought uh, for this. Uh, that's covered off in the paper. And there's the substance part in terms of the document that has been attached, um, and I don't propose to go through it. It's been um, in, in front of you before. Uh, HBRIC adopted all the recommended changes that um, councillors uh, made to that, and then subsequently there has been just a, a small deferment while we waited for the um, LTP to land so we could get the correct numbers in there in terms of the distribution policy. And look, and the only thing I'll say in relation to that is just, you know, just look, thank Council for their engagement with HBRIC prior to that decision. There was good engagement and it gave the HBRIC board an opportunity to, to think about it and contribute back to, um, to Council's thinking, so we um, appreciated that opportunity. Thanks, Tom. Any queries on, on the paper? I, I had a query on the statement of intent. And it's to do with the word consistently. Um, it was our role Page five, the generation of commercial returns in a consistently growing income stream. Um, and I think the, that word's used, or the word steadily is used later. Um, taking the long-term objective, which this uh, statement of intent also refers to, in terms of growing the asset base, is the word consistent causing you a problem in the sense that there may be years where you need to err, err on the side of growing the balance sheet, so to speak, uh, and uh, building up those reserves against inflation rather than paying a dividend, such that the word consistent is sort of running against the long-term aspiration of... Is, yeah, are you happy with the word consistent or would the word steadily, which is used later, be a better one? So I think... Um now you'll appreciate this. Uh, the, the reason we're happy with consistency is because we've defined it as a five-year rolling average of, right. of return, and so that's um, great. Oh, so we've, we've uh, sorry, I didn't spot that. That's brilliant. Any other queries, uh, Councillor Harding? Yeah, Court Chair. Um, look, it's probably a very simple answer to this question. 
I note that the, we have a SIPO for the managed funds, but that's not the totality of the work that HBRIC does. Is, is there a gap there, or is it the rest of the assets are covered the, clearly by the letters of expectations? That's that's great great question. Question. Yeah, so it, it is a good question. And so, yes, there is a, there is a very specific and directive um, SIPO, which was recently updated in relation to a subset of the assets. Um, and then there's, I suppose, what would you call an amalgam of documents that kind of inform the broader strategy. Um, part of the work that HBRIC is doing is to, you know, is, is to create a holistic strategy over the group assets as a part of its new mandate. So um, whether you call that a, a, a SIPO or a direction, but this, um, this statement of intent has had to try and straddle the new mandate where it talks about uh, HBRICS assets, which is required under the statutory um, f function, but also point to the fact that you've given HBRIC a broader mandate over Council's assets. So, um, so I think the simple answer which you're looking for is that you know, there, there needs to be an encompassing, an encompassing overarching strategy that informs all of this. Thank you. Um, well, we'll just supplementary then how, so that's something that we can expect in the pipeline to, to have a, a a coherent overview. Yeah, look, absolutely. There's a corporate strategic on the fourth, but um, and and the HBRIC recently uh, had a board meeting on Monday, um, and look, this is top of mind in terms of we're now working, you know, proactively and quite helpfully alongside HBRC staff in relation to HBRC held investment assets, and when we could do that work, um, you know, we're eager to get back in front of council and, and, and discuss that because I know that your expectations from the investment portfolio you know, have been raised. Thank you. Councillor Curtin. Just if I could comment um, on Councillor Harding's um, question because it's, a, it's an excellent one. And um, well, first, I'd, I'd like to say that um, the um, change to this, to this agreement uh, is, was brought about by the council decision to request an, a special dividend from from HBRIC, and I can say that um, uh, the independent uh, uh, directors have proven excellent value in that because pointing out very innovative ways of which to, we can we can realise that with minimum impact on the investment portfolio. So, so um, a, a good question for council to ask of HBRIC, and the value thereof um, coming back to us is, is, is going to be realised, I think. Uh, the, the second part of this, uh, and Councillor Harding's question, um, really goes to the, if you like, the in-principle mandate uh, that Council's given to HBRIC uh, to not only look after the HBRIC assets as best it can, but also to consider uh, HBRC assets. And um, so that, that's fine in principle, what we're struggling with at the moment, or at least investigating and working through, is the best means and mechanism uh, for that to take place, um, and therefore uh, requiring a deep dive into the respective asset groups that we've got, and and if you like, bringing to the surface some of the, the issues that go with managing that. Uh, it's certainly not an easy process. Uh, and I would, I would say when you look at um, the um, in, in this document, the performance targets is sort of a really gross high-level directive to uh, HBRIC, but it's clearly inadequate to get to uh, the, the level of, if you like, detail and confidence that uh, the, an agreement that would look like uh, that, that HBRIC needs to have in play. And um, the aim is to bring back to Council uh, those options and for, for Council to consider those options and sign off on that direction of travel. Is that fair re reflection? 100%. Thank you. Thank you. If there's no further queries, we um, might go to the recommendations, which is to receive the, the updated statement of intent. Councillor Harding, happy to move. Do we have a seconder? <coughs> Councillor Curtin. Um, would you like to speak? Thanks. Councillor Curtin. No. Anyone else to speak? Councillor? Yeah, Williams. look, I've just found the five-year rolling average uh, reference that actually highlighted it uh, in my reading over the weekend. But it says total investment returns will be assessed as a, on a gross rolling five-year basis, and I hadn't drawn the link between that and the consistent the growing return to the council. I mean, an investment return and the dividend expectation are 
maybe slightly different things. Mm. So perhaps some greater clarity around the wording of the SIPO on that point as to what it, what it means um, for those um, return expectations to the council. Thank you. Great. That's no further comment. Um, we'll go to vote. All those in favour? Aye. Aye. Against? Carried. Thank you very much, Tom. Thank you. Right, EICC, so um, as well as those councillors, does Ian come No? Oh, we should. Would you like to come up, Ian, or just leave it up to our chair, committee chair? Get up the chair. Thank you. Right. <laughs> Very nice to be adequate. Thank you, <laughs> chair. Uh, thank you. Through you, it is a committee of the whole, so... Um, uh, I think almost. Oh no, there were a few, a few missing, but I'm sure you've, you've caught up on the minutes. Uh, probably most significant was the presentation from Lincoln Agritech on the results of the five-year Braided River research project. Uh, so it was an excellent morning, and it it ended with um, this recommendation um, coming back to the chief executive to consider the implications of the research for flood resilience, Kotahi planning. Um, and really picking up, um, Councillor <laughs> brought this uh, view to the table, really picking up that the aquifer recharge area is something that should be considered in terms of planning and protection as we move forward into Kotahi planning. Uh, Councillor McIntosh and I then also attended the staff morning where the team came in and presented to um, the river engineering staff. That was a brilliant morning. Um, Ms Brunton's um, had a couple from her team there as well, from the planning team. So that was a really interesting morning, sort of digging deeper into the layers of understanding how it works in terms of engineering. Um, Tonkin and Taylor were there, who were running the scheme reviews, so talking about how um, some of the work impacts into that. So I think we've really come to a place where there's quite a growing understanding of what the implications of this may mean. And if Nick was here, I'd ask him um, quite where he where he was going with that, although I acknowledge it's been a, a pretty busy month. Uh, we also did have um, some fantastic presentations from NEWA that are all available to, um, to people online looking at the movement of silt in the cyclone and this interesting um, phenomenon, phenomena, um, the movement from the silt from the Mohaka River that's sort of ending up right up in Gisborne. So again, sort of really deepening our understanding of how the processes are working. The research has been really quite extraordinary. I think we really enjoyed that. Uh, and we had a very deep dive from um, Chris into the IRG program and uh, flood, uh, flood work going on there. Again, a really excellent paper for anyone in the public that wants to know where all those projects are up to, all the cost implications and the timing. So, I know I'm chair, but just to say, another excellent meeting from Environmental <laughs> Integrated Catchment <laughs> Committee. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, um, Councillor Sears. Any um, questions for the Councillor Sears? No questions. I think um, I think the timing of the Brad Rivers project has been excellent with everything else going on, and it's just another part of the puzzle that we're, we're all trying to put together at the moment about how we move forward. So that's been great. Um, if there's no questions, we'll um, get a move, Chair. Um, we've got a move and a second mm. for the report. Councillor Sears and Councillor Roadley. All those in favour? Aye. 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 Against. <coughs> carried. So we're on to Local Government New Zealand AGM um, and we've got some remits there. So we've got uh, Chair Ormsby, Councillors Roadley, Sears and Hokianga attending, is that correct? So this paper is, is really just dealing with the, the remits and how we want to vote on them. So. Um, does everyone understand, or we've got Leanne here that can perhaps talk to anything that we're unsure about there on? I guess the first thing is, do we understand what each one is? Do we want to um, um, support or oppose everyone, or perhaps abstain at this point and leave it to the delegates? 
all just abstained altogether. So any any queries? Or do we, do we want to run through them one by one? Yeah, I think so. yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Um, remit one, representation reviews. Um, do we need to, any, any further explanation or, or just a, really a show of hands about yeah, that? The report was quite comprehensive. So. Yeah, ta we'll, we'll, we'll take the report as read. Sorry, I'm just kind of trying to so find Maybe just it. read out the actual, each remit. And if it's good, so it starts at remit two. Behind. Okay. So reputation, um, representation reviews, remit, that LGNZ advocate for changes that support the provision of timely and accurate regional and sub-regional population data to councils for use in council rep representation reviews. That's a point. Seems pretty straightforward. Yep. We support that. Support yep. that. Yep. Any, anyone oppose? No. Uh, remit two, community services card. Want me to read that one out? That LGNZ advocate the central government to amend the health entitlement cards regulations 1993 so that the cardholder can use the community services card as evidence for the purposes of accessing council services, which would otherwise rely on a form of means testing. Mm. That would have, um, through you, Chair, or perhaps through Dan, this would have very little impact on any of our services. This is mainly um, driven to district councils and city yes, councils. Yes, it would be it? mainly yeah. district and city councils who run things like pools and recreational sure. facilities. That so it would be for entry to those types of um, places. Mm -hmm. to use a community what about the buses? I think that's already in play, isn't it? Yeah. It is. Yeah, community it. services card's already on the, you know. So that's, well, then it's mentioned here, it says to add, <coughs> and previously amended the health entitlements to add public transport to those able to request or demand to see a card. So I think yeah, it's linked to our B card system, as I understand. It is, but uh, in terms of um, pools, <coughs> recreational yeah. facilities, those types of things, I think that's what it's for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. I suggest we don't Either way. Just abstain. adopt the position on that one. We just stay up. Do we? Okay. Have mm -hmm. I'm happy with that. If Everyone else is. Does that mean we leave it open for the delegates, uh, delegates to Remain make a call on the day, or you want to stay? Um, uh, yeah, that's why I'll be interested, Chair, and um, Anne's take on. Do we need to formally abstain and just say don't get involved, or do we just say neither support or oppose? What do we? What do you think we need to resolve here? Um, well, that's for you to decide and leave up, and then give the delegates that um, instruction. If you would rather that they totally abstain and withdraw, yeah. or whether you are happy for them to do their own conscience vote. Right. I don't know, I don't have a strong view. Yeah, anyone got a strong view either way on that? Yep. That being the case, I mean, do we leave it up to the discretion yeah. of the delegates from the day? Delegates. That, that one? Delegate. Yeah. Delegate. Remit three, local government constituencies and wards should not be subject to referendum. The LGNZ lobbies central government to ensure that Māori wards and constituencies are treated the same as all other wards and that they should not be subject to a referendum. We oppose the idea that Māori wards should be singled out and forced to suffer a public referendum. It's put forward by Palmerston North City Council. Support it, Billy. Happy to support that. Yeah. Yeah. We've got support for that. Correct. Yeah, why is my list running out on that? Uh, so remit four would be um, the same. Slightly different. <laughs> this will be a change to the Electoral, electoral Act, Chair, I think, isn't it? So, yeah. um, in other words, whereby Māori seats would become entrenched as a oh, general structure of Parliament and the voting system within statute, and it could only be changed by 75%. That, okay, so the remit is that LGNZ proactively promote and lobby to entrench the Māori wards and constituencies for the 64 councils which currently have these to require the support of a supermajority of parliament should either parliament or council seek their removal. 
through you, Chair, I'd like to hear um, Mr Paku's view on that through the Māori Committee. I, I, would, I would strongly... Um, I would strongly hope that the council would actually support this. Uh, what it does do, it takes the uh, political angst out of um, right. various governments and political parties uh, playing with this particular uh, issue. It would have been nice to still if it was entrenched in the constitution, but let's set off for what is at the moment. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, so what, I, what I see in this is it actually takes takes that political angst out of out of the conversation because it would require a seventy five percent majority of Parliament uh, to bring about um, that change of what we're currently currently witnessing in Parliament today. As a former politician, uh, Councillor Kitten. Oh, look. Um there's no harm in, in supporting this. Well, I support it myself, yeah. but I can't see any, any yeah. harm in supporting a, a, a signal that's, that, that goes forward along with the other remit. Yep. Uh, I think it's uh, useful if, if, if local government goes in this direction, then um, at least they've made their case. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Harding. Kia ora, Chair. Uh, look, I support uh, Mike's... Um, at all, 100%. I support the, the principle here, the idea, the commitment to Māori wards. I'm uncertain about the mechanism. Mm. This seems to me this is a this is a signal, <laughs> as Councillor Curtin says, rather than necessarily the correct, the logically or you know legally correct approach. And, and it immediately raises the question. One, this, it, it's taking, in some respects, is actually handing the fate of those or the control of those seats on away from local government. I think the, what we really want is local government to be able to control that. But this is essentially for uh, taking a subset of those, the current ones, and putting them into a different process. So it, it raises a whole lot of, it raises legal questions that simply the paper doesn't address and a whole lot of other things. I can, I get the co-popper. I'm just not sure that it's the right mechanism. And so I, my preference would be where you support the, the idea behind it, but we leave it in this case to our, you know, to a conscience vote <laughs> for our delegate, having, you know, to listen to the room. Is it? Because to me, simply not enough information. So I'm seeing a few nodding. Any of the delegates feel comfortable or Want to talk to that, or? Well, I was going to say is I'm very inclined to take Mike's advice on this, mm -hmm. um, but we did say to the select committee on the local government amendment act, get out of our lane. Yeah. And this is saying this is getting into Parliament's lane, so um, that was kind of where I was a bit torn on the whole thing. Mm. Um, yeah. So I don't know where that leaves me. It, it, it's certainly not the most ideal yeah. uh, uh, yeah. mechanism, uh, but it seems to be the only one that's sitting there at, at present in regards to this uh, particular forum. And if I might add through you, Chair, is that um, before this would have to go anywhere further, there would have to be a lot more work on how, how it could be um, put into um, a form that would result in in what the changes that they're seeking. So what they're actually seeking is just that those councils that already went through the process in, as this council did um, in 2021, 20, 22, early 22, um, that they won't be meant now to have to either withdraw their decision or go to a, a, a binding poll. But, that would make that that directive from central government um, have to have a 75% vote in order to go forward into the bill like it has done. If that makes any sense whatsoever. <laughs> I think everyone's looking a little bit confused as to where we're going to land on this. 
Um, is it one of those ones we leave up to our delegates to perhaps investigate further no, at the... Listen to that. Let has got a mic. You have it? Yep. Uh, happy with that, yep. Thompson? Yep. OK. Thank you delegate discretion. OK, thank you. Great. Uh, remit 5, graduated driver licensing system that LGNZ advocate for changes to the fee structure for driver licensing, better preparing young people for driver license testing and greater testing capacity in key locations throughout New Zealand in order to relieve pressure on the driver licensing system and ensure testing can be conducted in a quick and efficient manner. Put forward by Ashburton and District Council. Yeah, I didn't understand this. I really don't. Yeah, Katrina, could you help us with this one? Because how does this help or hinder getting young people who are at risk or whatever or unable to access <coughs> training into, into... I'm slightly talking out of turn. Yeah. It should really be Liz uh, Shrilicky, a road safety mm. uh, person. But, <coughs> excuse me, from what I understand is over the years, uh, funding for driver licensing has been reduced. And so, and the locations in which you can get your driver license has also been significantly reduced. For example, you cannot get your restricted license in wide or you can uh, sit a learner's license, I think, and that's about it. And so what we're creating or what has been created around the country is uh, sort of uh, driver license poverty, uh, where you end up with yeah. huge amounts of unlicensed drivers yeah. uh, who then end up uh, in front of the courts because they're driving on learner licenses rather than uh, unlicensed drivers at all. And so it's about investing in that system. Which we would, in the road safety, Hawke's Bay, uh, we would support. Yes. Putting appropriate resources in place. Correct. Uh, Katrina and Chair, what's confusing me mm. is that the complaint in here seems to be that Waka Kotahi uh, decided not to charge people for their reset. Oh. Um, so it says, according to Waka Kotahi, only 53 people on a restricted licence pass their first time round. And so they introduced a revised fee structure which removed reset fees. Yeah. And then that swamped the system, which means people can't get into the first one. Oh. And so they're actually, it seems to me to be saying, charge people for their second uh, yeah, reset that, that, and you'll get more people into driver's licences. Oh, my so apologies. You see what I mean? So I'm, I'm a little bit see, confused about what that. this remit's actually doing um, and whether it's a good thing or not. That's not Through you, Chair, I think it's it's already actually just happened last week. Correct. Yeah. It happened yeah. last week. They've removed yeah. it. You get one free reset and yeah. then, yeah, you, and then you pay. So that's actually already happened. So, so the government's be. reversed that one called Tahi yeah, policy. Already. That's right. Mm. So they're going to spend more money or study. Yeah, through you, Chair, it, this seemed to me, if you get to the bottom of the, of the yeah. paper, it seems to be about Ashburton District Council wanting to try a different way, of, a yeah. different form of graduation for, as in the steps in the driver's licence system. And, you know, and which, so it's unusual that, that this is what was it, sponsoring it a, a particular council to do a particular job. <laughs> I, I think, again, it's probably very well-meaning and maybe very good, but again, if we can just leave it to our delegate to yeah, sound, do sound, right here. Idea, yeah, they can hear the conversation and get a better sense of it. But yep. What do you think, Katrina? I mean, is there any advice you'd be giving us? Uh, well, I can certainly get some advice from Road Safety Hawks Bay for your delegate, yeah, so that she is forearmed before she attends the meeting. Thank How you. About that? Thank you. Brilliant. Yes. Okay, <laughs> moving along quickly. Number six, remit. Proactive lever to mitigate the deterioration of, of unoccupied buildings. The remit is that LGNZ advocate to government for legislative change enabling local authorities to compel building owners to remediate unoccupied derelict buildings and sites that have deteriorated to a state where they negatively impact the amenity of the surrounding area and to incentivise repurposing vacant buildings to meet region specific needs, for example, a combination of <coughs> conversion. This is, this is the Gisborne District Council. Yes. Um, well, there goes why, right? <laughs> <laughs> my, my view is we should stay out of that one. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Anyone want to get involved? No, it's a world stain. Actually abstain. Yes. Structure. Yeah. Okay. Is it so? So remit seven is appropriate funding models for central government initiatives. 
The remit is that LGNZ proactively promote and lobby for the development of a more equitable and appropriate funding model for central government initiatives. <laughs> How could we not support that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> we strongly support. Support? Yep. So we're doing that already. Yep. Yes. Yep. Okay, number eight. Last one. Yes. Uh, goods and GST revenue sharing with local government. Hmm? I mean, yeah, it, do I have to yeah. read it out? It yeah, no, speaks for itself. Support that. Yep. Support that. <laughs> yeah, I've read Hawke's Bay Regional Council would get $10 million a year if we got our GST back. Mm -hmm. Wow. And just think what that would have made for this year's conversation. It would have been in a huge difference. Yep. Oh, well, I'll put a support there, Pina. In year on year. Um, great. So that's the end of the remit. So I guess we'll go back to... Um, 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 <laughs> <laughs> then we just need to confirm here that the second will be a delegate who's unable to attend. Huh? Well, it's going. There's a couple of others going. There's three others going. Um, yeah, it's and then names in the paper. Yeah. To the oh, so Does anyone want to? When, when, what day is it on, Wednesday. please? It's on the Wednesday. What time? Not there. So you're not there. I just need to check. I'm not sure what time I arrive. What, will you be there early? Be there on Tuesday. Oh, there we are. Yeah. Councillor Hawkeyunga will be there early on Wednesday. So. It's a strange thing, isn't it? Yeah. For you. Tuesday. <laughs> Wednesday. Tuesday. Tuesday for the morning. Uh, yeah. Okay, so that um, Councillor Hokiaga, <laughs> um, Councillor Rowley, was there three more that I've missed somewhere? Uh, no, it was just what Leanne raised then about what, oh. um, who the <clears throat> confirms the councillor will attend alternate delegate. So other than that, if we can move all the recommendations um, whole. We just need a mover and a second. Yeah, Councillor Roadley to move. Hmm. Councillor Harding to second. Um, second. Uh, Councillor Harding to second. Oh, yep, sorry. Chair, um, we just move a, a one through three. So, oh, so decided. Decided. all of them that we've de as, as decided. Yes, right. decided. Including yeah. Councillor Hockey Young. Yes, yep. Right, so, thank you. <coughs> yep, happy to move that. Uh, so we'll second motion. Um, anyone like to speak to that? No? All those in favour? Vote against. Carried. Right, we're just about there. The fixing of the common seal. Can I just make one comment just in relation to this paper, um, paragraph three and four. Uh, specifically, when you read four, it says as a result of sales, there actually hasn't been any uh, sales. Uh, technically, that should just be the balance of uh, what's currently on our books for those lease mm -hmm. properties. Um, we've only actually issued one warrant um, that used the common seal in the last period. Right. Anyone like to move? Councillor Curtin and Councillor Sears second. All those in favour? Aye. Aye. Against? Carried. Um, report from the Māori Committee. Mike Paku, would you like to? Uh, I only have one, one um, comment, Mr Chairman. It's in regards to an item that's actually not on there, and it's more for councillors inf information. Um, as part of the Wairo uh, Tukiwa report, uh, the bar did come up in their, in, 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 in their report, uh, raising their concerns about its current position, its position at that time and the need for work to be urgently done on it. So that's just good information for councillors so you don't walk into an ambush or anything. And other than that, I'm going to just take the report as read, Mr Chairman. Thank you. Any queries for Mike? I can die, die can go in first. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions for Mike on the Māori Committee report? No. Um, can I have a mover for the recommendations, please, to receive that? Councillor Van Bate and second Councillor Hokianga. Anyone like to speak? All those in favour? Aye. Aye. Against? Carried. Thank you. Set. You do. That's yeah. us. Yeah. Thompson. Uh, Councillor Hokianga, you open up. Oh, yeah, Tato. Um, so we did have our karakia at the beginning of our of our meeting, and then we had the karakia to transition us from uh, 
this this morning's session and into this session. And so, uh, if I can ask uh, us all to join now, Karakia Kiata. Next time.